Hello and welcome to Painless Universal, a conversation with myself and Welsh. Today I'll be talking to Juliet and what inspires me about Juliet is her passion for the human humanitarian world. She's come from a background where her parents were medical doctors and went on to actually do work in helping people. And she's used that knowledge she's gained from her parents to keep, keep on the good work and keep helping people. And she's also doing amazing work in the fashion world as well. She has a bespoke lifestyle brand and lifestyle company where she helps organize massive loves rules events and other things she does and she does them very well. She was the winner of Miss, Miss Galaxy Award, Award which, was, which was a competition done in Europe and she did so well and competed in it and came and won, won that event. Um, she's so much more that I just don't want to spoil that I'd rather that comes from her meet Juliet. Hello everyone, welcome to Painless Universal Conversation with myself and Welsh. As I previously mentioned in my introduction, I've got the gorgeous Juliet here with me. Juliet, thank you so much for joining me. We're out in the countryside and I'm absolutely delighted you took time out from your busy schedule to join me. How are you today? I'm good. I'm honoured to have this opportunity to chat through really topical different uh, sorts of conversations that you do is literally to try and inspire the younger generation. I love it. And people just in life navigating. I think that it's uh, not many people do it. It's an, it's an honor to be on your platform and it's exciting to kind of look through stuff that's very different and see different people's approach to how they do life. So thank you for having me uh-huh. from rural Cornwall as an Aussie. Uh-huh. It's, a bit, it's a bit of a there, but um, lovely to be here. Oh no, absolutely. Um, I hope I hope the weather is treating you okay. But before we get weather has been yeah. phenomenal, but we've just had a bout of some crazy wet weather just literally the last two days, which we probably needed. Oh. Um, but it's turning this afternoon again. Hence, I'm in a jumper, the first jumper I've put on for three months. You're joking! So, oh, yeah. All right, the weather here is a little bit. London is a little bit crazy, but overcast. Is it a bit overcast? Yes, it is. It is overcast and. It's not raining, it's not, you know, do something. Are you raining or not raining? It's, that's what we're dealing with right now. Um, I want to start by telling our audience a little bit about yourself. I want you to tell us who is Juliet, because you have so much to tell us. And from there, we'll just go on to our main conversation. Gosh, who is Juliet? Well, I mean, at core, um, I'm just your regular regular Aussie girl, a wife and a mother. And I think those things define me. Um, I'm nothing extraordinary. I think we are all, we are all extraordinary, but I am ordinary. I'm an ordinary girl trying to do all extraordinary things with my life. And that's only because I've got great people around me that are cheerleading me, believe in me. And I think I've got a bigger purpose in life and a bigger focus, which I think we all need. Not so we're not insular. We kind of look at the bigger picture. So I don't know if that answers the question, but um, Juliet, Juliet, who was Juliet? I think I grew up with many labels. Um, I was very successful as a young actor at a young age. From Australia, I came to England and um, my first professional job was 16. And I think that was definitely a struggle of trying to have my labels define me and also about my identity. My identity was in the roles that I was playing the success that I was gaining and the way that people looked at me on that platform. And I think internally it really hit me when I was slightly older because I thought if I'm not Juliet the actress or Juliet the singer or Juliet recording the album or Juliet on television, then what is my worth and identity? And I had a great journey with finding out actually the identity that I'm created in in the image of God with my faith rooted me in who he says I am, a daughter of the King. Um, sitting at the right hand of Christ and basically being on a journey um, where it doesn't matter what label I have, I'm still worthy. And out of that, I just felt that creatively, um, I wanted to do something to change the world. And so my bigger purpose was to, I mean, as a businesswoman, I wanted to make money to support charities that I believed in. I wanted to, um, I'd been very exposed as a young girl at major human rights atrocities all over the world because my dad still at 76 is a human rights doctor. Um, He spends, other than COVID, where he's been locked in in Australia and on the COVID team there, he has spent 
90% of his life since meeting Mother Teresa when he was 25, just giving to the poor and the needy. So I spent a lot of my younger life in a juxtaposition, living this life, you know, of fame and on the stage and performing in front of the camera. And then my time between schooling would be going home to Australia, which was an amazing life, but in between spending much time in refugee camps on the front line of war zones, watching my father do operations on Bambi Slats, helping him through that, assisting, working in orphanages. And uh, and my first trip to the jungle, I was about six or seven and we walk, you know, 14, 15 miles a day for 24 hours. We camp in uh, rice paddies, lay in straw. I mean, we had armed guards with us because it was the middle of a, a war zone. I mean, one night we had to be evacuated. There were bombs going overhead. And it wasn't that my father was ever a father that um, put us in danger inadvertently. He just felt that if he was on this journey, we would be on this journey with him. And I'm so grateful for that because that moment helped me navigate the rest of my life. Yeah. I was able to go through and, you know, really have a sense of compassion for those who you know, culturally different, who have far less than I did, lack of education. Um, but we are all, at the end of the day, we all bleed the same blood and we all go to the loo and we all have those same things. We, it's a survival instinct that we all have and we all want to be loved and we all are born to live in relationship. So I think it's, it's a long-winded story to answer the story of Juliet because I think it's, you know, I'm now the big 4-0. That's 40 years of a very lived, lived full life. Um, but I would hope that I'm your everyday girl with compassion for my brother and sister in whatever nation out there trying to do something to cheer them on, to support them and stand up for justice in areas of persecution. I think that's a big big part of what my husband and I, you know, are passionate about now. Oh, yeah. No, you said this story about your parents because your, both your parents were medical doctors and they also... My, mother, my father are medics, specialised in tropical medicine and yeah, oh. paediatrics, yeah. That is, a, uh, that is really amazing because they went on, not just being doctors, but they also went, um, your, your father was particular, went on to say, I want you to see the world. I want you to see the other side of this world, which you have probably yeah. won't get to see if I, if you don't come on or come with me on this journey. The first time you can you recall the first time you went to a place, probably be in Africa or in and you know Asia. It was in Asia, in how, Thailand. How did you feel being on a, such a different world from where you normally would would have normally been? I think you know my parents always. Have, from the day I was born, I remember we always had guests in the house or they were, my dad was all, always off flying some, I mean, I flew probably before I could walk. I spent most of my life in a plane flying across the world. So they took me everywhere. So early memories that probably sink in deeply was probably around six or seven. And having, that's when you start having empathy with the situation around you. You realize there's a difference in a sense. We're all, you know, children playing in a creek in, in Australia or in Northern Asia or in a war zone or in England, playing games together. There's, there's no differentiation. When you get to seven or eight and you get, you know, you have choices, mm. you notice and you, you are aware of a sense of belonging and safety. There's, you, you're more aware, you, that's when I began to realize that how blessed I was and how different the situation was and the fear that they lived in being driven out of their homes, um, mm. you know, having lost parents. I mean, I, I, I witnessed horrific things. I didn't see them personally, but I was witness and privy to what was happening. And, you know, the pure genocide still going on, Aung San Suu Kyi before she was under house arrest up in Northern Burma. Um, it's been a civil war, I think over 46 years now between my, in, on the Karen Thai Burma border, there's the Karen, the Kareni, the Lahu, the Lihu, all the, the tribes along their babies put in rice pounders, you know, the children being fed and fed and beans put, put out as human white mind sweepers. Seeing this was, I was very aware yeah. because I used to see the accidents that my father had to operate on. You know, I remember this one chap that mine had gone off. He must've been no more than 13 and they had his whole face had in an explosion gone off. So my father literally had to sew the side of his head and they put in a 
they t he took some eye doctors in. They actually placed a, a false eye. And I remember going back three or four years later and he was just so excited. And, and this one other chap, you know, he had a, a hole in the side of his stomach. St st I mean, my father could literally push mm -hmm. his fist in, sorry, in the side of his leg. Thigh, thigh kind of upper buttock and my I remember that they had to sew it up bit by bit and again three or four years later running out and saying Dr. Martin Dr. Martin and playing football so mm -hmm. seeing those things and being privy to that and seeing people who've lost lives you're in a war zone you become acutely aware of how privileged you are and acutely aware of injustice around the world and you know we're talking all all parts of you're right my father spent a lot of time has spent a lot of time in Pemba in Africa Mozambique he's been to Dili East Timor he's been to uh, Gunakarabakh he's been I mean global wherever there's major persecution he will go where NGOs can't simply as you know to cross borders where people can't cross borders he will go where there's need so having grown up with that it was almost a fearless upbringing yeah. um, and I think that's probably what helped navigate me in actually the performing arts world, because quite frankly, you've got to be fearless to go into that mad, crazy, amazing industry. Um, mm. But equally, as I went on with business, um, I think one of the questions you asked me earlier was what, what gave me the imp impetus to start a luxury leather goods company. Mm. I never did design in my life. I just, I was always crazy about handbags but I saw it as a tool to make money to give back to the refugees and give back to young women and it worked so much in Asia I had a I, I found an incredible team we shipped all our leathers from Italy I started started the other way around I mean literally I started let's just do this buy the machines let's just do it I could design them and I did design them having not been to design school but just always being artistic and, you know, our first collection was picked up at uh, Fashion Week and we went straight to Harvey Nicks. I was a sellout in the first season. Now that has got to be a miracle. Because... That was a miracle, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that that is a miracle. You got that. I Very few people get that right. <laughs> it, was, it was, I was just, I think in hindsight, having thought about it, I thought, oh my gosh, I must be absolutely mad. And my daughter asked me now, I said, no, no, don't do it, don't do it. But I think it was that fearlessness. That's true. Um, Hmm. And it's not that I feel that I'm not in, um, what's the word, when you're invincible. It's not that. Yeah. It's the fearlessness to feel of you could see people living as I, they lived and how resourceful they were. Hmm. I had this underlying feeling that there's no excuse. I've got everything. Hmm. We've got education. We've got freedom. We've got, we can travel. We, we have the tools. You know, what, there's no excuse not to do something to change the world. Yeah, I, I think one of the things I'm getting from what you're saying is that when you see people who are less privileged than you, being in that environment actually gives you that drive. And I think it's one of the reasons I actually send my kids during the summer to go to, you know, somewhere where there's less privileged, people are less privileged, for them to really get that sense of wanting. And you get that drive every time he comes back. He comes back with a sense of, oh, if I have all of this, I better be doing more. That drive, and I think this is what led you on to this happy nickel. Is that when you started the Miss Galaxy? Um, that oh gosh, that was. Do you know what? How did that tie in? I'm like, so no, before that, I I've always been, you know, with the whole injustice, um, yeah. human rights kind of side of my upbringing. I think it was definitely a blueprint that I do something. You know, whenever I see a, someone in a persecuted situation, something in me, my belly rises up. And I had a, an extraordinary um, privilege of going to Greece with a lady called Christine Kane, an Australian who um, has a phenomenal story. She's got a big platform in the States, but she had, she was originally Greek, adopted um, in a very poor area of Sydney. Um, sadly gone through horrendous abuse, but had come through the other side and was, is about freedom for women. And I was very inspired by her. She became a great friend of mine. And she'd been traveling back to Greece and had seen all these pictures of children just stuck on the wall. And she walked through the terminal and said, what is this? And they said, well, they're the children that have gone missing. And she literally, something in her broke. And she's like, what do you mean? In this day and age, children go, that can't happen. And she started on this journey um, of setting up a big charity called A21, um, rescuing, rescuing women and children predominantly from sex trafficking and so I was asked to go with her and a lady called Lisa Bavia from Colorado and we had a week together and I just spent time with these women that had been trafficked you know sw walked through fields for, for 
days or dumped in the water and they had to swim for their life and then picked up in Libya um, from Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, you know, across from Russia, across all, I mean, all over Europe and come through Albania. And I remember this day so specifically, there was a situation with one of the young ladies who had been abused horrifically by her traffickers and she had got pregnant and then they started abusing the child. And this child was around five or six, she looked, but she may have been older because often when you've gone through something so horrific, you are a lot less, more, less mature. Mm. And I, she came up to me and she sat on my lap and she just started stroking my face and, and touching my hair. And she said, you smell, you smell so good. You smell so good. And if you know anything about sex trafficking and trafficking and abuse, there is a distinct scent that is linked to abuse. So of the signs and the signals through abuse, the, the smell will be something that triggers in an, in an abuse situation. And I just, so for me, I was safe. She felt safe. She felt a peace and she felt like she could have a hug from me. And I remember just getting on the plane and just literally weeping all the way back to England because my daughter was less than a few, maybe a couple of years younger. And I the thought that that could have happened to my child. And by the time I got off the plane, I literally was like, I've got to do something. And I got a call. I, it was the old days when you kind of, it was text message. So, you know, put on my phone. It was like 2000. Yeah, this climbs to 2030, it's 2012. So I got my phone and just went, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. This thing just went on and on and on. All these messages. How do you mean in Greece? I'd love you to speak at this breakfast. How do you mean in Greece? Can you talk at this? And I thought, oh my gosh, this is real. I've now got a platform. And I just felt it was the impetus to do something. And so I started a climb for freedom um, and took 15 women representing 30, 21 nations because like my I'm English Australian there was Polish American from all over the world different walks of life to rep every step representing a child woman or man rescued from the ring of trafficking and it was I can tell you I mean I had some pretty hardcore women on that trip and I remember the husbands coming in saying you know how many mountains have you climbed and is my wife going to come back in one piece and you know one of the ladies you know ran a floor at Goldman Sachs like 500 people and there was me and I'm thinking oh my gosh I've got to lead them up a mountain but I knew at that point it wasn't this was not about me this was about the bigger picture and I can tell you out of I think I think hadn't snowed on Kilimanjaro for the best part of 30 years. And we had eight inches. I mean, we might as well be wearing crampons. And it was just, and, and no one had summited for two weeks. And I thought, I am not coming back down without my team summiting. And of course, all girls, all pink. And that we got on, it was like moving a small village with the amount of bags we had. And I remember all of, I bought my um, guides from America because they, they'd been in, um, they'd climbed Everest. And actually my, Best, one of my best friends had broken the world record climbing Everest. So she was the one that prepped me for this. And I thought she was coming. She said, I'm not coming. You can do this. So, oh, great. So here I was mm. leading a company of women up a mountain, having never, never climbed a mountain in my life, super fit. But it was the most extraordinary six days wow. of our lives. And out of that, I know every single woman, um, their life was drastically changed. We raised a huge amount of money, which we then went on to give to a couple of different charities, one based globally as in A21. And also we, we worked directly with Metropolitan Police in London because they had, didn't have the funds for their traffic department had just been shut down. Mm -hmm. So we, we had 700 volunteers and we went in and just started, you know, helping them because there were raids going on and no one to be there to hold these women's hands to give them toiletries to you know love on them and we had to get their story out within 72 hours where they were sent back to place of origin and most of them need traffic by faux police so they weren't going to speak to police they needed people they could relate to so that in itself was a huge achievement for the team and for the bigger picture then a girlfriend of mine went on to do row for freedom she rode the atlantic and then there was run for freedom they do walks for freedom so it really was a catalyst for change and i think out of that i was asked to do this competition miss galaxy universe the only amateur is that how that, is that, how that came in about is out of I think the, so many things yeah. for women. and again it was mm. it was a really it, it was about women finding their inner strength and i think as well for me it was a bit of a challenge yeah. um i like 
being fit. I was always, but I, as I trained as a dancer and you worked in musicals, I, I was always triathlons, young, one of the youngest triathletes in Northern Queensland. Um, so I always was fit and, and trained. So then I had this challenge as the first amateur to kind of compete against professionals, but they gave me an amazing team. And I thought, I've got to do this. I've got to do this for the women. Again, I met extraordinary women, women who'd had to overcome physical abuse. Um, a lot of them felt they started doing fitness to get strength, to kind of, you know, not just to find themselves, but give them tools to feel confidence. Um, I think a lot of that on the journey, I, it was really amazing meeting a lot of those women. I did feel though, you know, with change, you have, it has to be, it's not just a physical thing that you go through a lot of it about working out and doing that competition was a physical thing but it's a mental thing as well yeah. it's about you've got to push through when the pain is hard mm -hmm. and go to limits you've never done I mean I'd never pushed weights like that I had to physically change my entire body um, I was competing you know against you know professional bodybuilders I didn't do the bodybuilding category I did the bikini category but these people were professional mm -hmm. and I had so much respect it was a, it was a training and a science with food with it had to be all done, monitored, controlled. And I'd never, I mean, I just kind of ate what I wanted and was always healthy, but to get the results. But I, what I found with the team that came around me, mm. I just respected them so much because they were so strong mentally mm. and physically. And I think, you know, we, my third prong is you've got to be healthy spiritually. Yeah. And I think through all of this is I've done, I've got over the physical I've got over the mental and then it's the spiritual because ultimately if you've not got your core, your, your heart barometer, your soul in check, mm. then it's very difficult to impact those things. They become a, it becomes a controlled notion as opposed to an inspired mm. um, lifestyle. And I think when those things are all in kilter, you know, you really, you really can go on and get yourselves out. I mean, I talked to so many young ladies about, you know, who are very insular and suffer maybe with depression or have had horrific backgrounds. And so their navigation point is, has been altered. And the first thing we talk about, you know, through soul restoration, and I use this tool called keys to freedom, which is phenomenal is, you know, the roots, what is the root cause of this? Often we know, because often, you know, they've been put in situations that they had no control over through parents being abusers, drug, or just abandoned or, death or accidents or and so we know the background that we can work through but equally it's about them seeing a bigger picture and actually having compassion for others and often we give them focus to help others when you put your focus on helping someone else out of a situation actually mm. you know it's a natural it's a natural reaction yeah. you know you're helping someone they start feeling good it, it makes you feel good but equally what it does is take the focus off being all about you onto yeah. someone else yeah and and I think that in life has been has been amazing I mean with my own children we I set them projects mm. to do focusing on things you know as you talked about with your children you know whether it's selling cupcakes to raise money for a charity or mm. helping someone out or visiting the elderly I just think something that's a little uncomfortable but makes them see a different perspective no, that's really um, wonderful. So you win the galaxy competition in the end. I did. Oh Can you believe? God. That is unbelievable. Um, on the category bikini, um, the category uh, best. I think it was the best newcomer category. That's what I won for Miss Galaxy awesome. Universe. So which, uh, the hard I work mean, it was, paid uh, off. Sorry, the hard work paid off. Awesome. Yeah, I was in it to win it. You know, I'm a bit focused <laughs> by it. I think I, th I think that's what that's what's inspiring about you is that you're um very driven person. I think your father had hard work has actually paid off with everything you've done and you've shown commitment. But do you think mentoring actually helps you along the way? Uh, do you think do you have you have you got any mentor? Have they, that person helped yeah. you? Yeah, I've been really blessed. And one thing I talk about often is you know the friendships the people that surround you you know you grow up you have your yeah i call them the yesterday people you know they i was from a small village in mariba north far north queensland you know avocado plantations coffee plantations my dad was you know chief medical officer of queensland but it was it was jillaroo like it, we'd say i was a i was a jillaroo like an oka aussie cowgirl <laughs> quite you know it was in the tropics but it was that's what it was known for and it was the most wonderful and if there's anyone out there watching, yeah. love, wonderful way to grow up. Innocent, uh, for no, I mean, amazing. But it was quite a small town 
mentality. Three generations of Italians that have come from Sicily, like a lot of Australians are in 200 years old. I think, you know, my daddy, daddy was called the Doctoro, and we were in Australia, but he was still the Doctoro to the Italians. And I was Dr. Martin's daughter. And, but I, I think that simplicity, that environment, that whole upbringing just gave a fearless outlook to way of approaching life but equally I had some great people so they so they were my yesterday people a lot of them so some of them are my today and tomorrow people but they they didn't really change much from ever moving out at that time they'd be from Sicily that was it that was generations and generations I look at today people and I'll come back to reference that as you know the mothers at the school gates um the people that you end up doing life with because you meet at the gym or maybe a life group at church or, uh, or, or something like that you're involved in or an art class. You kind of meet them and they're on your way and you see them on a weekly basis. And then you have your tomorrow people. And those are the people that call out your purpose. And they said, this is great, Julia, but you're not going to be a 2.4 children picket fence in Chelsea. You've got a bigger purpose. So yeah. I'll meet you where you're at, but I'm still driving you and I'm pushing you. Mm -hmm. And we need all of those environments. But you, you, you want to share your dreams. You want to share your ambitions you want to share things that you've you've thought about with those tomorrow people today people will kind of be where you're at they'll, they'll empathize your yesterday people will be like oh my gosh she's another what, what plan is she, planet is she on because they can't really see past yeah. their existence so i very early on when i had the privilege of having these incredible mentors that spoke life into me constantly who i call up when i'm trying to navigate things through business or you know putting proposals through that are crazy or like climbing Kilimanjaro I mean you know I was just like I'm just gonna climb the mountain I had those people going Julia you're gonna change the world you've got to do this I'm gonna stand by you you're gonna absolutely I'm gonna be there and you know having fearful god-fearing amazing prayerful parents has made a huge difference in my life too so I know that that's a gift and I don't ever for one second, take for granted that deep gift. But I do know there are a lot of children, especially some of the young girls I've mentored on the World's End Estate in, in London, near us, where we live in Chelsea, is that they don't have that. And, you know, they have a cheerleader in life, someone that believes in you, someone that says, yeah, you can do this. And they're not sure and they've never, and I find myself a great connector. So for instance, one of these girls wants to be a hairdresser. Well, I knew a fabulous hairdresser and she wanted an apprentice. And, you know, the girl just did not have the confidence because she didn't have anyone to tell her she was a good enough or she could achieve it. They were like, you're never going to achieve anything. You're a waste of time. Who you think you're better than us? You know, that was the voices that she heard around her. She just needed one person to say, come on, girlfriend, you can do this. You can do this. We're on a journey of life together. Let me hold your hand. I've got time. I'm going to see you through to the end. And to see those lives transform. And to see gifts within people and draw them out and cheer them on to go into it's my it's, it's my i mean i love it i love it it's I'm, I'm privileged to have an opportunity to do it but it's i'm never challenged by it i'm always inspired when i greet, meet great talent and i meet dreams i love seeing dreams i, I know all dreams are a gift from god so if a, someone's got a dream then it's about how that's going to roll out so I, i'm i'm a great believer in that so because i had great people believing in me mm. and great things spoken over my life and people drawing it out of me and to and 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 also challenging me on it you know for me the best thing is to see is, is people flourishing and you know there's a journey you know a lot of these people don't have boundaries they don't have they don't they haven't ever learned that you've got to turn up for work on time so there's a discipline yeah. that also comes with that you know with but much is given, much is to be expected. So when those things are given, to walk through a journey, it's not just like, oh, well done, you can do it. It's about going, okay, you can do this, but you want to be the best. And you want to thrive and you want to be doing excellently. And you want to get in before everyone else. And you want to leave after everyone else. And you want to just make sure that you're, you, you know, you've outdone every, everyone. You know, you're there to be, you know, be a lady, be, be polite, you know, be grateful be thankful and you know they've never heard these things spoken over their lives or have anyone invest like this into their lives so for me that is a huge privilege and something that my husband and I you know we we don't take for granted at all yeah another thing I I, I, I follow you is your faith you are not um, you know some people are still neg uh, shy about talking about their faith but you are very passionate about your faith how's your faith gotten you through life I honestly, um, 
I, I, I don't know how people do it without a faith. Mm. I, I honestly, the moments in my life where I've, you know, hit some pretty big lows, mm. I think it's, you know, the Holy Spirit's only ever got me out of it. It's helped me navigate. And, you know, I've seen, I've, I've seen it tangibly. I've seen people's lives transformed and I've seen girls around me, their lives transformed. And I've seen the power of prayer. And, you know, I, I was at a situation with my son where, and my daughter, in fact, two emergency um, caesareans, where, you know, 20 seconds more, my, my daughter would have died. I mean, she, she was blue and um, she was rushed into intensive care. She had the cord around her neck twice. The heart monitor had stopped. I mean, it was a horrific emergency caesarean. And God rescued her. I mean, it was a miracle. We thought there was definitely going to be, um, you know, she, she may not pull through. And with my son, it was like one in 35,000. It was a case where there'd been 12, there was 12 cases, nine fatalities, and the other three, either the mother had died or the child had died or been mentally, physically handicapped. And, you know, we went to the top professor, Professor Jeanette in Portland. He was, he was the one that had, you know, done these operations. He was put his job on the line. And I'll never forget, I, the night before, because it was a very rushed, um, very rushed to get me in because I couldn't go into labor. And I, I'd done a prayer call and I called some very close friends, my family, my parents jumped on a plane. They knew, my dad knew it was not looking good. And I remember being in the Portland that night and they in fact didn't want to do it because they don't like to have fatalities. And they said, the, we don't do emergencies, but they do. They're the most unbelievable hospital. And, um, and obviously I was privileged enough to have it privately um and i you know and actually the first i didn't i was on the nhs having come from a medical background i thought oh i'll be fine but a actually i wasn't it's nothing against the nhs it was just uh, it it is just to do with the doctor and i but this time because of the case um we had gone privately and um i i literally remember tiggy was with my husband um said look i'll stay with said, no 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 you need to sleep my husband needs sleep i'm one that can live on four hours he needs sleep i said need you to be strong and i just i said just let's just pray before tomorrow and i had this immense sense of peace mm. and i just remember thinking i knew i just knew that i knew that i knew that whatever was going to happen it was going to work out for good whatever that was God was in control and I knew it was going to be okay. And I slept, I woke up and, you know, I'd seen the MRI the day before where the placenta had locked into um, my uterus and with the placenta accreta, procreta, which I had, you um, hemorrhage and, you know, the, you, lots of different complications. You've got to have a hysterectomy. And um, as they went into, I mean, I had three surgeons, four anesthetists, two pediatric nurses, a pediatric, I mean, it was just insane. And as they went to, they thought, we'll get the baby up first and then we'll do the transfusion for the hemorrhaging. And as they took Orlando out, the placenta just fell out. I mean, it was, there was a huge roar. And I knew that was, well, they knew it was a miracle. We'd all seen the placenta had grown into the uterus. So you're asking me, why is my faith so strong? Because I've been faithfully rescued and faithfully challenged. I'm not saying we've, all, it's always goes well it's not like it's a wish list not a genie in a bottle you don't pray and it happens boom but what i do know is that i trust god enough that if it really if things get rough and they may not be how i see them that he sees what i don't see yeah. and that has rooted my faith and i think having a husband who's got a deep faith as well you know has made it a huge difference to how we do life and how we navigate it and i I have, yes, had a great privilege of being grown up in that environment, but it had to be me. I had to make choices. You know, when I was working in the film industry, I was working in the business presenter, you know, there was choices I had to make. There was even moral choices I, I had to make. And whether it be, you know, going topless or, you know, swearing, taking the Lord's name in vain, those things, you know, it sounds crazy. But for me, you know, if I had a faith and I, I had, I wanted to make some some, and there's no judgment on anyone to that there's my own navigation point and you know there may have been roles that I, I just didn't comfortable doing and I gave up and my agent would go you're crazy you're crazy it's us actually I've got to go to sleep at night and if this is real and I value it this much and I see people all over the world dying for their faith then this is not so bad this is not so bad and I'm really glad because it rooted in me 
actually that this is real. And so you say to me, how, why am I bold about it? I'm bold because we are living in a world where you can't say anything anymore. And we're living in a world where everyone wants to, it's so politically correct. And we're living in a world that oh, you can't talk about cheese or you can't talk about God. And I just won't do that. I won't do that because I, I fervently know and believe and have seen that God has helped navigate and rescue me from things all the way through my life. And I want people to know the truth and I want people to understand that Jesus can set you free. So for me, it's a, a big part of my life. Thank you. That's amazing because I think the more people come out boldly and talk about their faiths, I think it's, if, if that's what you believe in, you say it and don't be shy about who you are. But the key thing that comes to me before we get to the final question is I love how you balance family you have a husband you have kids you're an entrepreneur you're you know you are so many things apart from a husband and wife and you know you're just so uh, your wife i mean and um mother but you're so many more and you balance it so well and you're able to juggle all of this and so many mothers out there are looking to you today and saying to themselves how is she still staying sane with everything, with achieving I, all of this? And I'm have, definitely not sane. I'm definitely not. How is um, she doing it? I, I'm sitting here, I'm like, please teach me one or two things. How are you doing it? Your kids are incredibly great. And how do you balance it? Teach other women, because I know one of the, one of the biggest things that inspires me as well about you is that you're a very good motivator for other women. You encourage them. You, you just don't see a, a girl out there. Your vision for a girl is to make sure she gets from A to B and not just A to B, but you also guide her. If you have time, how do you do it? How do you balance her? Do you know, I think it's, it's really simple. If you are not, it all starts with the home. And I, you know, it first, as I always say, first wife, then mother. And, you know, as a role model, if my children don't see my husband and I together on the same page, not, not codependent, interdependent with a vision and a purpose, then the whole thing is a knock-on effect. So we, I've got to get it right in the home. And, you know, I, I don't get it right all the time. I can be, I'm totally, I mean, you've got, I, I've had many a Benny, many a little, like, hissy fit. You know, we all do. But what I try and do is there's some basic things in life. First of all, good communication with my husband. If we are out of communication, then it really does everything. Everything doesn't, it's a roll on. Good communication with my husband, which means time. We have to book a date. We have a date night every week. No matter what, we have a date night. Good communication with my children, which means a date with my son, a date with my daughter, spending quality time where quite frankly, I don't, I've got, and I, I can get quite frustrated. Me sitting doing Lego, I literally want to, you know, pull my eyelashes out. I'm like, oh, but sometimes I just have to take a chill pill. And, you know, I'm not really a baker, but my daughter loves to bake. So I will bake with her or I will do something with Orlando. I'm not brilliant at spending hours playing football, but I can do a few flips on the trampoline and I can do, go and take in paddle boarding and go swim in the pool. Or we do activities. And, you know, my children, because of my background in theatre, one thing they, they love theatre, obviously you can't go at the moment, but I... I remember in uh, a Mother's Day, it was our first year of my son's school, I'm digressing, but it comes to the point. All these children were saying, I love my mother because she's amazing at maths. I love my mother because she's the most amazing cook in the world. I love my mother because she just is like the Lego queen. And I just sitting there, I, the, I broke out in a hot sweat. I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what the, I don't do anything. I can't do anything. Well, then what are they gonna say? I love my mother because what? What do I do? I can't, I'm not an amazing cook, I'm not a... And he went, I love my mother because she takes me to the theater and we watch me and we watch ballets and we sing together in the kitchen with the toast with the hairbrush and I thought everyone just burst out laughing and I thought yeah they, I can't do something so I think that is that's the tool I have to have my time of exercise yeah. um def, physical fitness I've got to eat well and as my husband always says darling you need to sleep well I love burning the candles at both ends I'm an early an early riser and I'm a late partier yeah. um, but he knows when my fuse is short and um i think you know those and also i need to spend time with the word of god if you have a faith if you have a relationship with anyone you want to spend time with them i have a faith i want to spend time with my creator which means i can't just preach it it's all about in the action and you've got to know you've got to really seek god pray meditate and that's something that i i do 
probably should have more discipline in that. I need to find a window daily. I, I usually get up at 5.30 and do that before everyone's up, depending. Mm. But if I've had too many late nights, I have to kind of work it around. But I remember hearing someone quite influential in my life speak and just saying, you just need to pray, Juliet, that you have to maximize your capacity. You think your capacity is this, but God is a miraculous God. And your capacity can be this or this or this. If, if he wants you to do it, you can multitask. You're not in a box. You don't do one thing. You can do many things. Give a busy person something to do. They'll always get it done. It was my father's mantra. And to be fair, I think if I don't have a project or two or three or four, then I'm the worst person to be around because I, I don't know what to do when I'm, I'm doing like nothing. So me chilling out on a holiday takes a good four days of some margaritas on the beach and I'll kind of get into it. But by the time I've got to the end of possibly 10 days, I'm getting a bit frustrated. But that's just me. I think as someone says, I, I run like a Duracell battery that's on charge fully. But that's my father as well. So yeah. I think it's definitely genetic and I see it in my son. So, whereas my daughter's far more chilled out. You do it well. I don't know if that answers your question. But I do think, and the other thing is, I have, in life, you need to keep short accounts with, with, you know, I don't let things upset me, grudges, hold them. I think you've got to be quick to forgive. You've got to not get offensive in life. People get very offensive. In this current time, within politics, within, you know, you name the subject, we there will be someone will be someone will probably be offensive. I mean, highly likely, I've offended all your viewers by this point. But you know, we have to be a people that don't get offended, that accepts. I have great friends of every faith, mm -hmm. and I love them, and I love they're passionate about them. They know how passionate I am about my faith. We discuss it, we talk about it. If they want prayer, I pray for them. They ask me, I'm on it. Mm -hmm. Does it make me intolerant because we're different? No. This is what we, we we're all in, in, in the word of God, it's talks about the bodies, we're all different parts of the body. And we need to accept and love unconditionally. And I think that in life has really helped me because I've met so many people from kings, queens, presidents, to working in slums with, where you're working with, you know, young victims of trafficking or, you know, abandoned children. It doesn't matter. It's from every walk of life. It's about getting on anyone's level, loving them, and you never know the story behind someone's life. Yeah, sure. So I always then say, teach my children. You know, that they, they got upset about someone, something said, said you don't know the story. You don't know what happened to them before they got to school. Sure. Maybe you know met their parents in an argument. Maybe they've lost a grandparent. Maybe they stumbled and hurt their knee, and they were just taken out on the because they're frustrated, or maybe they got bad results. You never ever know the story behind, and I think. If you can go through life, which I try to do, um, just always thinking the best of people, then, you know, you meet like-minded people and you're not disappointed and lack of, you know, offense and bitterness and lack of forgiveness. And I have been hurt deeply. I'm not saying I'm one of these, you know, I love the glad, I love the glad game from Pollyanna, my favorite game in the world. I am Pollyanna, but I'm also realistic. I, I've seen the persecutors that have persecuted and how the persecuted find love for their persecutors is something I don't know I could ever do when I've seen these girls harmed in the way that they've been harmed. Mm. But you know, if they can do it, then who am I not to do it for some mere offense that I might think is like the end of the world. So that's, that's definitely, if you're asking, I try and live life as Jesus would. Yeah, that's to be absolutely. Yeah, uh, you know, in light of everything, our final question is that in light of everything, we've seen the pandemic uh, with the coronavirus, we've seen so much going on in the world today. What's your hope and what next for Juliet? Do you know, it's interesting because I have, um, you know, quite recently launched, um, mm -hmm. I've always done it, but it's kind of come far more on the radar, you know, uh, it, a, an events company doing very high end um, parties on a, on a large scale globally and um, I, you know navigating children and running this um, and I have a carpet company as well and we have a charity foundation we do a lot of work in Sierra Leone which I want to talk to you about another time because I know we're going to run out of time um, and 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 some and some and some there are so many different things that I'm involved in um, and I just you know, you, when, you, when you're not on the controls, actually, through life, which I've had to learn with my faith, 
you know, if you want God to navigate it, you've got to take your foot off the, you know, off the steering wheel. You've got to see, you've got to keep going, but you've got to give him some yeah. level of really seek him. And I think when the pandemic hit, I mean, I was preempted because my father was over speaking at the global um, tropical medicine conference at the end of January, and he's been on the pulse of the whole time. Um, so I kind of was slightly more prepared than I think a lot of people simply because I, I just, they didn't not, it was just not a lack of knowing or understanding. It was just like suddenly it's on a radar and suddenly we're in lockdown. So there was a bit of preparation in the fact that, um, you know, we kind of thought there might be a time of lockdown, but nothing to what we've experienced. And I think when you strip back mm. to the basics, mm. which I think we have an amazing life in London and globally we've had a phenomenal, I've, I've been so privileged, but if you strip back to basics and you go back to the core and there's no influence, you're just there in your home. And I mean, so, I mean, no manicures. I mean, I thought I was going to become the best manicurist, no blow dry. I'm so sound superficial, no lashes, no waxing. <laughs> like, what am I going to do? My husband might see him as my real me and, and divorce me. No, I'm joking. Um, okay. I think it was yeah. really, that's how it <laughs> we felt at the time. Yeah, yeah, all these things, what are we going to mm -hmm. do? But, you know, actually, it was really important. I, I made sure we had a, a really good routine. My husband's a man of routine, too. Um, but we just, the time together absorbing one another and not having outside influence was just magical. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it's been, I am very acutely aware that this has been an extremely painful time for a huge amount of people, the domestic violence that's gone on, the abuse of children, illnesses which have escalated, financial disrepair, you know, people losing their homes, their livelihoods. I mean, it's been desperate. And I don't, I honestly, people keep talking about this divine reset. I know that God's given us a choice. And I, I, I just, these things happen in life. People want to point blame. This isn't, you know, God trying to persecute us. This is life and how we come out of it. So I really wanted the children to focus on that these are our circumstances. Mm -hmm. How can we come out that? How can we come out of this spiritually healthier, physically healthier, and mentally healthier? Where actually this goes against the grain of everything we've done. And I think what we try to do is spend a lot more time commu communicating, reflecting, um, doing lots of hikes and walks together. Um, giving time for the children to develop their talents, their gifts and talents. My son, I didn't even know he could sing like he could sing and he started singing. Um, my daughter and her art, she just loves it. She was so creative. And that we became a, a tie-dye factory. We became a, you know, I tell you the, crea the creative things that went on to, in this house. But all the things that actually you don't have a huge amount of time for in normal life. Yeah. So I come out of this making sure that we don't lose the sacred and I call it the sacred because actually we went back to some sacred moments that I think in relationships in life we've lost in a big way. And that is being in the moment. Mm -hmm. And that is not being thinking the next party, the next thing and the next big hurrah and the next big, you know, event and the next big entertainment piece. It's about knowing in this moment that you are fulfilled and at peace and whole and this is the best it's going to get in a sense that you've got those people that you've chosen to do life with all those gifts from God, those children, and you've been given them for a time to navigate. You're going to invest in them as much as you can shower them with love, cover them with grace. Even when they're, you want to <laughs> do that. I was like, there were moments that I had to literally go in my bedroom and <sighs> deep breath, deep breath, deep breath. But in, on the whole, mm. it was, phenomenal we had to find different ways of communicating even when you see people 24 7 like that you know it's pretty intense yeah but um coming out i really just hope that i don't lose the essence of the sacred moving forward yeah it's true is that your question yeah it does julia i'm really honored to have you join me this morning um i mean this afternoon i i'm honored to be oh, here glad. and thank you I'm so much you, and i'm a huge admirer talking about all the things about you, you, I think you're, you're. We're, I think we're two of a kind. I admire you, as a, you as a businesswoman, you as an adventurer, as a pioneer, as a, a spokesman for human rights and justice and pain. I, I'm so honoured to have this platform with you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, and I look forward to joining you again soon. Talking to you soon. Lots of love.